In this episode, you're going to learn how to create the conditions within an organization where service design can thrive, even if that organization is traditional, regulated, and not very open to change. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, this is Angela, and this is the Service Design Show, episode 111. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about empowering you with the most effective skills and strategies so you can design services that win the hearts of people and business. And the guest in this episode is someone who's definitely been doing that. The guest is Angela Obias Tuban. Angela currently works in one of the largest banks of the Philippines. And in this episode, we're going to explore what it takes to embed a design way of working in a tough context like a bank. Some of the things you'll hear in this episode are how you can use design research to actually better understand the people around you and the things they need so you can tailor the offering you have to that and how something like quarterly reflections can help you to shape a design culture. So at the end of this episode, you'll walk away with some very practical advice that will help you to embed service design in basically any organization, even if it's as tough as a bank. If you're new to this channel, welcome and make sure you click that subscribe button because we bring a new video to help you level up your service design skills at least once a week. And I know that a lot of new people are coming here. So don't forget to click that subscribe and that bell icon. For now, sit back, relax, and enjoy the conversation with Angela. Welcome to the show, Angela. Hi, Mark. Really nice to have you on. Uh, again, somebody finally from uh, a part of the world where I, it's really hard to find a lot of service designers. I'm sure there are many, uh, but uh, yeah, once again, I'm happy, I'm happy to have found you through Lauren in this case. Um, Angela, uh, so I gave a hint, like you're in a part of the world, uh, which is not the US, it's not Europe. Where are you? Mm -hmm. What do you do? Yeah, so I'm speaking to you from Metro Manila in the Philippines. So it's in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Um, and what I do is I'm officially called a design strategy lead, which essentially means um, I oversee user research and analytics and also am part of planning for digital products and services for one of the Philippines' largest banks, it's mm. called uh, Metro Bank. Mm. Again, a bank, just as uh, Lawrence Roda. <laughs> yeah, we, we are yeah. getting into the financial institutions in the latest last few episodes, but that's, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting field. Uh, Angela, I haven't prepared you for this set of questions, but the people who are listening to the podcast know what's coming uh, by now. It's going to be a 60 second uh, rapid fire and just answer as quickly as you can. Okay. Oh my God. Okay. Okay. So first question, what's always in your fridge? Milk. Okay. A lot of soy milk. Okay. Okay. Which books are you reading, if any? Right now, I'm brushing up on the Field Study Handbook by Jan Chipchey. Yes, legendary. Which superpower would you like to have? Oh my God, probably flying. flying. I think I would, would be... like it's just yeah. Would be nice to get out of traffic. Maybe you know, maybe one day. What did you want to become <laughs> when you were a kid? Oh, I wanted to be a business person. I felt like my mom was a business person, so I wanted to be like her. Hmm. Hmm. That's I didn't good... even know what she did. She was just a business person. Yeah, you wanted to be like your mom, which is always a good ambition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and final question. What is your first memory of service design? My first memory of service design? Oh, um, um, probably an IDEO video. I'm fairly sure it would have been an IDEO video talking about service prototyping and trying to build um, like a rough, prototype made with boxes and trying to prototype a service. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, good. IDEO has done a lot of good work for our field, so I'm, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I haven't had anyone from IDEO on the show yet, somehow. Not sure how that happened, but maybe we need to, we need to change <laughs> yeah. it. Um, 
so uh, the theme of this episode is going to be um, something related to how to design services that are useful, that work in an environment which has a lot of traditions, regulations, uh, heritage. So not the most easy environment to, to really practice uh, service design and thrive as a designer. And I think you'll be able to shed some light on, on how you're dealing in that situation and, uh, and give us some insights on, on how to create useful services, right? Yes, I, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure we'll be um, we'll, we'll get to some point. But when we were discussing this episode, um, you told me that this is a topic which is dear to your heart. And I, I really liked um, why that was. Can you give us a little bit of background? Like, why did you get into this and why is this important to you? Yeah, um, so I really started out my working life as a market research person. And through that job, I was able to see the power of listening to users and customers and listening to their needs um, and trying to apply that to improve businesses and marketing. Because that's mostly what market research deals with. It's mostly about advertising and brand, um, you know, product placement, um, packaging. But then um, there was this particular point in my life um, I, at that time, I was working for a, a media conglomerate, and I, I was, I was probably a, over a decade ago, yeah, like here in the Philippines, and around 2009, with my husband's <laughs> I don't know if you wanna. Is that fine? That's um, fine. Yeah. Okay. So in around 2009, I think that was the time that Facebook and like and, and video streaming was starting to. to become popular here in the Philippines and we were doing focus groups to understand how people were handling that and I was thinking you know I, I could witness that people couldn't remember what they were watching or you, they couldn't relate what they were doing on Facebook for example or on social media or in digital platforms in a in a focus group setting I feel like you had to watch them do it mm -hmm. um, so I was trying to pretty much influence our team to do more behavioral research. And that's, that's one part of it. It was, it was trying to understand that, oh, look, when, when you are actually trying to plan and understand interactive services or interactive platforms, doing the classic you know, survey or focus group doesn't really apply anymore. So I started reading up about all of those things, and that's how I started discovering, you know, IDEO and all of the writing on it. And aside from that, not just IDEO, but also, again, as I mentioned earlier, Jan Chipchase, who who was doing a lot of work then with, with mobile phones and eventually mobile wallets. So that's, that's one of the things that sort of got me into, into that. And then the other thing that sort of pushed me, I think, into this direction was, so after having realized that, we were trying to help the company plan. And it really wasn't just, um, you know, when people start, when, when companies, very traditional companies start realizing that things are changing, they don't necessarily know how to adapt. Mm. And it's not just an adaptation of the actual thing that they're delivering. It's actually the whole operating model and the whole business model that they have to look into. And, that's when I realized that even as a research person, I could only surface the insights, but I was always so frustrated mm. about the solutioning. And then what I what I realized from all of the ideal and all of the you know all of the design sort of what was that what was the trendy term for it before? I think before it was still interaction design. Uh -huh. um, right? It wasn't even it wasn't even UX yet um, in, in the olden days. <laughs> um, and they're the human factors. They were more embedded in the planning teams. They were more embedded in the ideation work. Yeah. So that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to be, I realized that I will always be frustrated no matter how much I understand people if I'm not actually part of the planning and design. Hmm. And that's how I jumped, shipped into, into sort of a design discipline. Yeah. Totally. And I think that's a big frustration, even if you're in the ideation stage and prototyping stage, that 
ultimately we want to impact the lives of people we want to impact yeah businesses and that's also what mm -hmm. i liked about your, your background story that you said um we we need better services like a lot of services are broken right and that's i think the, yeah. that's what i got from your story so far that that's the thing that drives you deep down yeah because uh, because at that time um again um having come from research the services there was this one project i even had which was this whole year of focus groups trying to understand the filipino trying to understand people in our country and what they need and what they're looking for and then you you know you can see that it was so difficult for businesses to sort of plan what to do next or what to do with that information so i i realized i wanted to be part of shaping that i wanted to be you know i have this um i have this personal mission it was it used to be it used to be i think on my website it's not up anymore but um that i really wanted to just create better products and services for for people in our country because a lot of a lot of the services here in our country like let's just say transport we have some of the worst traffic i think in the world um we have very little public transportation um so just that's just a sample but then it trickles down to a lot of things that um the people in our country because we are an emerging market have just accepted to be you yeah. know to be yeah. We, we yeah we just accepted that to be reality yeah. but you know things could be better and 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 that's the thing i hope that is driving a lot of the people who are watching or listening these episodes that somewhere deep down mm -hmm. we just feel uh and um an obligation to the rest of the of the people around us that we need to create a world where there is less mm -hmm. frustration about services yeah. where services are more consistent <laughs> more reliable uh yeah. yeah so uh, i think a lot of people should be able to to relate to your story and i uh, i haven't been to the philippines but i can imagine that the challenges around services there are uh, different than over here in the netherlands mm -hmm. for instance but mm -hmm. still uh deep down i think we share the same uh, same passion now you're working right now in an environment um which is uh which has a long ha heritage let's let's uh keep it at that uh, why what have you identified as some of the things that are holding us back um from uh -huh. not being able to deliver on those services that we would like to deliver on so have you maybe not just in the bank but in in the systems around us in general um one of the things is i think you know the the world as as you mentioned many people who are probably on this like watching um watching this um series already care about wanting to improve services and i think the world doesn't lack people who mean well people who want to do better by other people but the problem is really literacy for at least in my experience there's that's one of the things and um there's there's a lack of practical advice because in the recent years you know design like capital D capital D design and design thinking has been quite popular um and i think that's also why you know many of us have have roles now in 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 large corporations because um there has been a big uptake about the value of design however um not a lot of people are well versed in terms of applying it in an operational way um people understand the theory behind it um and people understand the value at least in at least in 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 what i've seen but actually applying it is a challenge it's and again as you mentioned especially because i i work in a in a company with a quite a um a long standing heritage it already has a built in culture and way of working so that's that's really part of of the challenge of of doing it hmm yeah so that, so uh m m yeah sometimes misconceptions about design sometimes just not knowing how to translate this into practice um Agree. uh forms of uh existing ways of working which uh uh fight against new ways of working right are there any other things that you feel are sort of holding yeah holding us back or holding the current existing non-working systems in place yeah so as i as I started to mention of course there's inertia um yeah. there's there's just the way that things are hmm. 
Um, and this, this applies to, to, I think, many, I mean, many teams that I've seen, not just necessarily where I'm currently working at, but, you know, the, as I mentioned in my example earlier, the, the common thinking is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. So if, if, if the business seems okay, or if the product seem okay, then there isn't much of a push to change how people are doing things. And yeah, again, I started out in research and analytics or research and analysis, and I'm, I'm very big on, on metrics and measures. And one of the, one of the challenges that I've seen is that it's also a reshaping of what the business values and is trying to measure hmm. because what happens is if you really follow, let's say, so let's say in, in, in my older corporation, like let's say on TV, on TV or like for TV businesses, the only thing that matters are ratings. So it's all about, the business is all about trying to suck in people to watch TV so that the advertising model runs. But, you know, because, of the onset of, let's say, digital platforms, or you know, the change in in the in the notion of ownership. Like, I don't have to own a CD any, anymore. I don't, I don't have to own a DVD. Um, how does that then change your business? Because the business, as it exists, has always been optimized for that measure and not for the new things that have happened. So, for me, that's one of the things. It's people getting stuck in in a way of working that is actually meant for something that is much older, hmm. for, let's say, a, a world that is much older. And I think that, especially now with the quarantines and the pandemic, that's really surfaced that. It's really challenged um, how businesses run because now all of a sudden, like every single business in the world had to think, well, I mean, other than those that are already online, um, every single business had to think of reframing or reshaping how they work. Hmm. So that's yeah. one of the things I think that is also the problem. Yeah, and I think you hit an interesting point there, like uh, measurements and measuring uh, that has been a topic on the show uh, often and what what gets measured gets done. And as long mm -hmm. as we keep focusing on things that might have become less relevant and still keep optimizing our services and organizations around those outcomes then yeah. it's really hard to, to change it uh, i think mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. also really challenging to bring in new reliable metrics that are accepted by organizations but yeah, yeah. Um, i think that's one of the assignments that we have as a as a community to to educate the people who are mm -hmm. in the positions uh, within organizations to start considering other measures um and and, and yeah. I think if I can add, um, I think the metrics around services are quite difficult because some of them are qualitative. Um, that's one of the challenges that I've seen in my work, that sometimes the way that you measure the, the value of the service, it takes a bit of processing. Because, I mean, there's always, of course, time. There's time, there's yeah. cost. Those are the more, like, basic things. But, um, you know, like, let's say pain points that people have along or across, you know, how they sort of use a service that's not always easily measured. People can sometimes measure it by severity or the lack of severity yeah. Yeah. or lack of severe problems, but um, it doesn't always accurately capture what you're trying to, to design for. There's a different way of measuring success around service-oriented businesses than around product-oriented mm -hmm. businesses. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. curious, in your experience uh, from the last few years, have you... Uh, what have you done to overcome some of these challenges like inertia, like this measurement challenge or like uh, their misconception around service, around design in general? Can you share a few stories with us? Sure. Um, yeah, um, they're, they're, not always, they're not always pretty. Um, a lot of them are things that I learned because I didn't do them properly the first exactly. time. Exactly. Which are so, the best stories, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so for me, one of the things, one of the things that I, I think I, that I had to learn. So actually, prior to joining, um, prior to joining the bank or the bank that I'm working at, Metro Bank, um, I was, uh, I was part of independent consulting, and I actually worked with a lot of startups. So prior to that, um, I was very much used 
to a culture where I was primarily working with engineers and designers on a day-to-day basis. Um, and then one of the challenges that I prepared for coming into the bank was, you know, being in an environment where, you know, not everybody is, you know, quite, let's say, um, equipped with the type of information that they would need to actually do the things that they wanted to do. Um, a, like, lot of, like what? a lot of people... Like, like Yeah, so um, one of the things, for example, is MVP. Just the concept of of just the concept of oh, I don't want to talk about this, but the concept of agile or agility and being lean, um, mm-hmm. because right, like a, a lot of you know, even in service design or a lot of the design disciplines, it's all about prototyping and trying to get something out into the world to learn, um, and that is very hard for people who have worked in environments where you really have to push a polished thing out into the world or a polished, let's say service you can't really like for example one of the challenges of a bank is that you know it has a whole branch network and you can't you know they don't normally roll out a half-baked thing or a a purposefully half-baked thing or they don't roll out anything to let's say just a handful of customers because the planning is usually quite broad so one example is um there's so many but one, one example is um we've tried to get them into certain frameworks. And one of the things that I think I had to learn was repetition. It doesn't, it's, you know, um, that's this whole old marketing uh, or advertising thing about repetition, repetition, repetition. Um, we, we work in, we work in fields where we design behavior. And I guess I had forgotten that you can't just say or, you know, you can't just announce something and then expect people to run with it. You really have to, um, you really have to equip them and help them operationalize what mm. they want to do or what you want them to do. So one of the challenges, for example, let's say some something simple like testing, um, testing a prototype. I realize you know people want to do prototype testing, but it isn't enough that you do a walkthrough. So I started with doing a walkthrough with everybody. Um, I would have a walkthrough with everyone who was part of, who would be part of um, watching the prototype test. But then I realized after the first run that they were so used to market research because in market research, everyone who is an observer really literally just mm-hmm. watches. Yeah. And they're not the really yeah. part of it. They're not engaged. So I had to do a second run of walkthroughs where I already demanded that we do a practice run and then also that every single person has a role. Hmm. So that way, we also control the number of people attending prototype testing. And they also needed to be an active participant. So you can't just go to, you know, you can't just go and then expect that you can just sit at the back somewhere and then expect yeah. the research to run. You have to really part, be part of it. So that was uh, one of the things. But yeah, yeah, with yeah. that, we also needed to have templates. Well, yeah, I think uh, yeah. just to touch upon what you are saying, um, mm-hmm. a lot of our work is also empathizing with the people we are working with and trying to understand f- from their perspective mm-hmm. on what we're doing and their environment, like what's going mm-hmm. on, uh, what are what are their monthly or quarterly targets, um, and Agreed. and coming from that position translate. Uh, that into our design process. I think that's one of the most common mistakes I'm seeing designers and service designers make is just slap on the design process onto every challenge they see and be super user focused, uh, but forget the people who need to help you and you need to collaborate with to actually make make this work. So there is, I hope it's changing, but this it feels like you're also saying the same thing, right? Empathy for the people not just for yeah. the end users, but the people yeah. who you're working with. Um, I agree with that because I um, one of the things that I actually tried and, and am learning is that the design work that we do happens in various levels. So there's sort of the organizational level that we're trying to design, which is, as you mentioned, it's about it's about empathizing with the people that are also trying to make this happen because you want them to, you want them to be able to do it you want them to be able to also apply it to their own roles because it's not it's not just 
let's say it's not just my job to understand um, customers and then apply it into my work. It's actually everybody's job and everyone has to be part of it. So there's the cultural and organizational layer. And then there's also helping them understand the process of it, of like actually how to do it. So I've, I've done various things for those levels. Like, for example, for the cultural layer, um, I can give, I, can, I have two very specific things that I think have worked for me. Okay. One, so the broadest thing that I can think of is I actually made, um, I made a people framework for our team. Um, and this is, <laughs> a lot of people I know are not fans of four tracks. And I'm not saying that we should all force rank, but what, what I've learned to do, and this comes from my job as a research person, as a qualitative researcher, is um, the force rank can sometimes help you surface if your people metrics are actually try are actually incentivizing the correct behavior. Wait, yeah, so, can you, you yeah know, I need an example. Yeah. What do you mean? Okay, so for example, what, what you can do for, um, I've done this in various teams that I've joined, that are really engaging the different managers. So, and to ask them to rank their, <laughs> to rank their team from their most valuable to yeah. the least. Yeah. But you know, that's not the important. The so ranking is important. And actually a lot of managers usually refuse to give me an answer, but I try to tell them that um, I don't care about the rank. What I care about is their reasons behind it. Yes. So I try to ask them about each of the reasons why one person is better than the other. And we surface that to make a performance assessment um, framework. So, for example, for engineers, um, so I think it's most straightforward. So, for engineers, um, one of the managers said he values one person over another. And then when I asked him why, he said, oh, because although one of them is amazing at math, which is critical for code, the other person, which he ranked higher, had cleaner code and was a better team player. He was able to have he was able to have such well organized um, documentation of how he worked that he was also a good senior to other people, which was more valuable to him than someone who could just um, you know brute force and sort of crunch a lot of, of numbers to sort of um, do a lot of things. So having said that, though, um, it really goes to show what the manager values in a team. And if you take that example and then you apply it to the various disciplines that make up um, a team that designs a service, hopefully, you know, you can end up coming, you, you can end up with a framework that captures what you value as an organization. So, for example, um, in our team, we always say that we value scrappiness because we, even if we work in a bank, we want to be able to um, still think lean we are very inspired by the whole lean startup methodology where it's, you know, you try to ship something fast and then you learn and then you apply. We're, we're trying to, to replicate that, but within a very structured, um, within a very structured and rigid environment. And we, we have some progress, but, you know, we, we had to, I had to take that scrappiness and see how does that, how is that sort of, how is that um, translated into behavior? So for the different members of our team, um, who is actually scrappier than another. So that's one of the things that sort of helped, helped me um, communicate to the, man to the other managers that I work with about what type of behavior right. we should incentivize right. in our team and right. what type of behavior we really are looking for. So that's, that's one of the things on a broad cultural level that, yeah. that has worked for, for me. And that, that's interesting because you're applying basically design research onto the internal process. On and people. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But on the, not 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 so much on the on the end users, but on not the at people. The end, yeah, yeah and, and that's quite interesting because uh, you're taking somebody like a manager as a tar as a sort of the uh, end user or consumer of this information, and then you're doing uh -huh. uh, using design research that the things that we know and do to surface the type of information that will help. Um, decision makers make more informed and better decisions that help to create, well, yeah, to, to mm -hmm. improve because, team performance. Yeah. So, yeah, things they value. Yeah, because it, it, it really is about, um, as you mentioned earlier, it really is about shaping, you know, um, the work that we do, you know, service design is really about shaping people's interactions. And, pe and usually, you know, it isn't, I mean, I work in a, in a, in a field where it's, Kind of focus on digital but even in a 
even in a world where you're designing digital interfaces, behind the scenes, there are so many things that are run and done by people. Exactly. And yeah, and, and you want, you, I don't want to be disrespectful to their expertise. I don't want to be disrespectful to, to you know, to, to the things that they, that they have actually measured and done well. But it's sort of incorporating that into, you know, sort of, I don't want to say newer because it's not, it's not that new. Um, it's sort of incorporating that into uh, a different way of working. So, and I don't know, it's sort of a cheat. It's a cheat on my end. I know the other thing is evangelization. I'm not a very good evangelist. Um, I, I don't, I, I still struggle on that end of the whole design thing. Um, so I, I know that some people are very good at it, the whole presentation of innovation. I'm, I'm not, that's not my core strength, but because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a research person. That's sort of where I attack it. I like where you're more comfortable. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Sort of, um, what people value in a, let's say in a team or, or how they measure a person. So that's, that's sort of where I apply. Yeah. As you, as you mentioned, I apply, me applying my design research into, into internal team members. Hmm. So yeah, which is, I think a really good development for uh, the design discipline to applying it to the people around us and with, with services. I think it's, uh, I've made uh, quite a few videos by now where I think what the message is that it's really hard to design a service. The best we can do is to design the environment in which services emerge. And then, uh, yeah. it becomes a really interesting, uh, uh, discipline as we're not so much designing the artifact in between quotes of a, of a service, mm -hmm. but we're designing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the, the stage where the performance uh, sort of has to happen on the moment. And then it makes a lot of sense to, to yeah, think about the people mm -hmm. around us as the design material. Um, so we talked about, you talked about inertia, measurement, uh, literacy, um, any, any other useful things that you have found in your practice again to overcome these challenges yeah um so uh, that's i guess the, the people framework is more about again the cultural layer yeah the other the other thing is um doing regular i mean so again there's also about the actual work itself so that is sort of trying to build a sort of culture that preps people um, for what we want yeah. to do, but then there's also equipping them on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. There are two things that I found that really worked. Um, one of them being, one of the things that I had to learn the hard way was not templatizing things. And I actually, <laughs> I, I, I have to give credit to one of my teammates who used to be like a, uh, a business analyst and process engineer. Um, she, she made me realize that not everyone can look at a document and make a template out of it. So sometimes we have to be really literal. Um, so one of the things that I thought that I thought was kind of easy to do was I made I made a presentation for us for every release. So I was thinking, okay, for every release that we're trying to put out into the world, we have to be very clear about um, what insights went into it, what's the scope of what mm -hmm. we're doing, um, what are we, what's the goal, who are we trying to serve. Um, uh, what are the learnings about the internal processes that also went into this particular phase? And I was trying to do, I was trying to model um, the usage of it. So every time we had like release planning, I would also do, I would show it. And then, you know, I'd try to walk. It was, a, it was for me, it was, like, it was a fairly simple thing. Like it was super clear with yep. what the goals, with the target. Um, but there was like, there was barely any uptake on it. And then, <laughs> And we had like a fairly small team at that time, so I, ha I realized I had to strip it down, make it an official template, give it to people, and then sort of, short of requiring it, had to sort of track whether people were doing it. I'm not a big fan of, I'm not a big fan of tracking whether people mm -hmm. are following a process, um, because I, I, again, I think, you know, when you work in design, you're so used to people who, you know, because when you're a designer, your output really is the documentation when you're doing like a wireframe or a map or a like service a blueprint, flow. customer journey, yeah, uh, empathy blueprint. map. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, that you're really used to working with these templates that like you have, not even templates, but, you know, trying to, a, a general framework and then trying to fill it yeah. in. 
So I kind of assumed that most people would be able to do that. But then I realized that um, even for, let's say, defining things, mm -hmm. people really need to have something to follow. Especially, so what, what, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah, especially when it's about like designing an experience. Um, it, it's very vague to people. So when you say defining. they need something to follow, what what is mm -hmm. that? What what did you eventually? How how did you did your how did your approach change? Yeah, so I ended up I ended up creating templates for people, and then also having walkthroughs for those. So rather than because I again before I thought I should just model the behavior. Like if I model the behavior, people will naturally also see that the value in it. That oh okay, that seems to be working well. I'll apply it into my own work, and then. And then yeah, I realized that doesn't really work all the time, so so I had to simplify. I had to also break down the documents that I made, and then um, I had to simplify it, make it like a template with actual um, definitions, and then also how to answer it. So for example, for creating a roadmap, um, I had to make a sample yeah. blank roadmap yeah, yeah, where it yeah. said, okay, um, what is in what is in a first release? Mm -hmm. so in a first release, there should like you should have a theme or a goal, a clear audience, and then what are let's say the the user benefits within yeah. that yeah. Um, first phase. So I had to be quite um, literal about it, but I, yeah, I mean that that at least showed an improvement because people had something to follow. I remember that when uh, I was creating uh, templates uh, at our service design studio, we usually at the back of the template we just have a manual. Like uh, one one page, oh. one side would be uh, when it would be physical. One side would be the template, yeah. and the other one, the 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 back side, would just have arrows and uh, annotations and st start here. And I yeah. I uh, I recognize also what you're saying, especially if you. Um, want to have people outside of the design mindset oh. using these kind of tools? They need a little bit of um, what is it? Uh, examples, guidance. And guidance. Yeah. That's the right word. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It it was I think because again um, because in the, the the years prior to coming into 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 this type of environment, I was used to working with a lot of engineers, and engineers are so you know, rabid about learning. Mm -hmm. um, they really, like the whole, you know, the whole open source thing and the whole self, you know, they're all self-taught or many of them are mm -hmm. self-taught. So it's, they're very active in terms of trying to to sort of adapt these things. But then, yeah, I, ha I had to remember that for people who are very used to how they work, you really sort of had to push them a little. And the other, the other example that I think I have of something that worked is I I started introducing quarterly team retrospectives um, because there were you know within a project there are retrospectives but um, I wanted the team to sort of have a view of how we were working together and to, to treat ourselves as not a product but to treat ourselves as something that all, was also growing and iterating. Um, so for example, I just, I just have this um, this anecdote on why I think it's really important. One In one of the presentations that I gave, you know, it was, it was a presentation, I think it was a research presentation. One of my teammates approached me after and said that she was so surprised because she had never seen anyone admit to missing something or admit to a gap mm -hmm. in her work openly in front of leaders. And I didn't even, like, during my presentation, I didn't think of it because it was just, you know, for me, it was just part of the process. You try to look at the work that you did and then, you know, you have like, to improve yourself. You have to see the things that you were not doing very well. So I wanted to be very transparent about that. Um, but again, to people who were working in corporate all their lives, that was, I, I realized it was quite unheard of. It was unheard of to actually stand up in front of a group of people who were, you know, driving yeah, the business yeah, and actually yeah. say, I didn't do this well. And that's when I realized I had to, to get the team used to it. 
um, that it was like a muscle. I guess it's like a muscle. You have to get people Absolutely. used to using yeah. that the transparency muscle. That it's okay. Like how are we gonna? How are we going to adapt a mindset where we can test things if we we can't be honest with ourselves about things that aren't working, you know, within us or you know about how we ourselves work together. So yeah, that was one of the things that I tried to introduce. I kept it at a quarterly pace because I. I didn't want to sort of bombard everyone on a monthly basis um, with, you know, having to reflect on how we were. So what I did think, you do yeah, in these the, res reflections? Year. Which questions were you asking? Um, so I just, I actually just tried to follow one of the things that I learned from a scrum master that I worked with um, many years ago, um, where it was very, I liked his way because it was very kind. Hmm. Um, you try to look at your own habits and your own output and behavior and you ask yourself, so what did I do well and what could I have done better? So he mentioned that specifically because he didn't want any finger pointing, that doing a retrospective wasn't about pointing out other people's faults. Because again, it was about trying to, you know, absorb a culture of being, you know, I guess accepting a failure because you want to be able to learn. I realized yeah, that that was yeah. the problem. Most people are afraid. Um, I, I don't I don't want to be cheesy and say, oh, I know people should embrace failure. It's actually not the failure. It's the learning that's important. But mm. if you don't put yourself in a position where you reflect on things that you didn't do well, then how are you going to, to improve yourself? And, you know, to be, to be honest, like the first few, the, the, like the first two quarters were a challenge. It was a lot of patting ourselves on the back <laughs> um, and then still kind of blaming other people until I think at the third run that we did, we really didn't do well that quarter. Like we didn't, um, we didn't work well together as a team. So I just went straight to what we can improve um, about ourselves. And I, I also tried to be snappier about it. I followed, ah, I have to, I have to, to, to look for the link for that. But it was a process where you do one, two, like one, two, five. You do one minute with yourself, two minutes with a partner where you talk about the key things that you, um, that you wrote um, when you were, you know, um, doing the self-reflection. And then five minutes with a group where you each talk about um, one of the, you, you each talk about the themes that came up from your discussion. And then you try to talk about it as a, as a group. And then... Because we were also getting bigger as a team by, by that time. So we needed to have um, a, a snappier dynamic. And then from there, we wanted to be actionable. So after we surfaced all of the things that we didn't do well as a team, um, I tried to ask the team to force rank. Well, not force rank, but um, to choose what they feel are the most critical things to work on for the next quarter so mm. that we can track it. Um, yeah. Because usually, you know, you'd come up with like yeah. 20 things yeah, yeah, that yeah, we yeah, can yeah. improve on. Yeah. But, you know, realistically, the whole team can't work on all of that. So we just have to be, we had to be very um, specific about, hey, as a team, what are the three things that we're going to commit to practicing in the next three months? And it was great because um, some of the younger team members really got into it in the, er like, in the, in the stages that we were doing it, um, where they were even trying to make acronyms. For, for some of the principles that yep. we wanted to try um, for the next quarter. So it was good because at least you really got like a team dynamic going about um, things that the team wanted to be better at. And especially if you're, in an, if you're working in an environment uh, which is different and has different habits, different ways of working, and you're used to in a design context, for one, it's really good to recognize what the things are that you take for granted as a designer, for instance, the, mm -hmm. um, the openness about failures and uh, scrappiness. And I think we, mm -hmm. a lot of us don't even realize that this is, mm -hmm. this is different than most people are used to. So that's step one. And step two mm -hmm. is then thinking about, okay, how can we improve? How can we grow? What can we learn from this and this uh, critical thinking and reflective mindset, which is all, mm -hmm. also part of the design mindset, but you have to apply it to yourself and to uh, the context that you're working on. So that's um, 
yeah, I, I can totally see that work. And especially when the team is growing and you have some values that you want to adhere to. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. If you um, if you had to summarize and give maybe people who are listening and watching right now uh, some quick tips um, on how to tackle these challenges, what would be like the key takeaways for you that, that you'd share with other people? Um. Well, I guess it, this might be really vague, but I, I guess the, the theme for me is really, you know, our work is about making services work for people. And that just that doesn't just mean um, the end customers that we serve. Because, yes, I mean, that's one part of the discipline. It's trying to map, you know, the experience of the customers that we serve and trying to understand how the services that we build line up to that. Um, but there is also much to be said about understanding the processes and the people that actually make the service run. And my, I think my favorite um, tip is learn from, like, one of the things that I'm reading about Lean is that they have a thing called Gemba Walk. What, what is it? Um, Gemba. Okay. G -E NBA, it's a Genba walk, which means going to the place. Um, so the the people who made lean manufacturing or the lean processes, so like the beginnings of yeah. Six Sigma, um, for they were saying that for you to understand a process of how something is being done, it isn't enough that you it isn't enough that you try to like understand it or like do desk research. You really have to go to the place and watch the people who are doing it. Um, and I think that it's really beautiful because he also says you have to go there, ask why. So it's about, it's really, I mean, for me, like even, I think that was, that, I mean, the whole lean manufacturing thing was what, 40, 50 years ago or probably 60 years ago. But even then, even then that was the principle. It was about um, observing the process of how something is done, but asking why. So that you are able to then sort of, you know, make solutions even for the people who are mm. in the team. Mm. Um, because sometimes, again, sometimes it's not straightforward. Sometimes it's not as straightforward as telling yeah. them, oh, we need to do prototype. We cannot testing. expect oh, them to, to yeah. We cannot expect them to get into our world, right? We mm -hmm. we have to get into their world and then move from that place. At least I think that's a more effective approach. Mm -hmm. Agree. If you uh, can't run design yeah. down their throat, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, you know, and the, the 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 thing is, we're not we we don't feel like ramming design down their throat. We we're just so excited about design that we want to share this passion with everyone. We're so in love with it, and uh, we forget that sometimes uh, other people have other uh, things that they okay. need to worry about rather than falling in love mm -hmm. with design. Um, mm -hmm. Angela, it was really interesting to hear some of your experiences. If people want to continue this conversation with you, uh, can they reach out? And if so, how? Sure. Um, I'm on Facebook. I actually have a Facebook page that I, I, I curated sort of all of my um, experience design related work there. It's, it's my name, Angelo B.S. Duban, UX Research. Um, it's in you the can show also notes. Tweet yeah. Tweets. You can yeah. also tweet. Um, my, you can also find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle is Yellow Ice Pick. Don't ask. It's an <laughs> old. I was a teenager when I made it, so I kept it. Okay, so uh, either Facebook or Twitter, and I'll make sure that all yeah. the links are in the episode description. Um, awesome. I learned a lot. You. Uh, articulated some of the things that I think we need to articulate more often uh, around the design, the discipline of service design. So um, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Angela. Thank you so much, Mark. And just, I'm just so happy that you have this initiative happening in the world. I think it's a great, it's such a great thing to be able to, like for me to be able to listen to other service designers as well about, you know, the, the work, like actually how they do their work. Is incredibly useful because it's so hard. It's so hard to find um, practical advice on how to do our work. So thank you. Happy to hear that you're enjoying it as well. That's uh, 
That's nice. Thanks, Angela. I really want to thank Angela for sharing her experiences with us. And I hope that you enjoyed this episode and found some very useful and practical advice in it. If you know somebody who needs to see this episode, grab the link and share that with them. That way you'll help to grow the Service Design Show family. And that helps me to invite more guests like Angela here on this show for you. If you'd like to get more practical advice on how to design services that win the hearts of people and business, make sure you check out this video because we're going to continue over there. See ya.